Welcome to ME215 Fluid Mechanics 1. This is an introductory fluid mechanics course as taught by the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Saskatchewan. So the very first thing I want to talk about is what is a fluid. And in particular, I want to contrast fluids to solids. Now we all sort of know what the difference is between a fluid and solid, but we want to formally define the difference between fluids and solids in this introductory lecture. So let's say we have two plates here. So a plate on the top and a plate on the bottom, and this plate on the bottom is fixed. And between these two plates, we have a solid material. Now these plates look like they're kind of small, but you can assume that they sort of extend to infinity to the left and the right. We're only worried about the material between these plates. Now what we're going to do is scribe a line in that material. So I'm drawing a line in that material so we can see what happens to that line when we apply a force to the solid. Now a key thing about the force we're going to apply to this solid is we're going to apply a shearing force. So notice the force is parallel to the orientation of that plate. So we're grabbing onto this plate here and pulling off to the right. So a shear force is being applied to this solid. Well, when we do that, if we look at what happens to this line, we'll find that it'll deflect. It'll undergo some deflection, and we could measure the angle of that deflection as theta. So we apply a certain force here, maybe 100 newtons. That will result in a certain deflection here. But the key thing about this deflection for this discussion is it's a static deformation meaning that this line will deflect some angle, theta, maybe one degree or whatever, and then it will stop. So for a given force, there'll be a given deflection that will result, and it'll be a static deformation. This whole thing will reach equilibrium, nothing will be moving. Now we want to contrast that with what would happen if we did exactly the same thing with a fluid. So here we have the same two plates, but now there's a fluid between the two. And realize when I say fluid, this could be a liquid or a gas. Both of those are fluids. So some fluid between these two plates. Now again, we put a line. That's a little bit harder to do in a fluid, but it can certainly be done with dye or, or uh, small gas bubbles or smoke or something like that. This is commonly done in the lab. It's called flow visualization. But it's easy to do on PowerPoint here, so we just draw a line in that fluid. Again, we apply a force. And again, important to realize this is a shear force that we're applying here. Well, what would happen if there were a fluid between those two plates and we applied that force and we observed what happened to this line. Well, after perhaps one second, we might see the line there. Two seconds, we might see it there. Three seconds, we might see it there. So the key thing here is that if this is a fluid as opposed to a solid, this theta is gonna to continue to increase with time. So there's gonna be a continuous deformation. And this is the difference between a fluid and a solid. A solid can support a shear force with a static deformation, but a fluid must undergo continuous deformation to support a shear force. And that is the key difference between a fluid and a solid. Now, realize again the importance of this being a shear force. If we were to think of a different type of force, a compressive force, then really there's no difference between a fluid and a solid. And I'll just try to draw a couple of little sketches here to illustrate this. In thermodynamics, we talked about these piston cylinder devices all the time. So let's have a piston cylinder device. Inside of this piston cylinder device is a solid. And if we apply a compressive stress to that, so we push down on that piston rod, then this solid will undergo a small static deformation. It will uh, reduce in volume a tiny little bit, but it will be a static deformation. Well, if we go over here and we do the same thing on this side, so we now have a fluid in here, and again, we push down on this, then the fluid, whether it's a gas or a liquid, will undergo a static deformation. Our piston will move down a little bit, but it is a static deformation. It doesn't need a continuous deformation to withstand a compressive force. So for compressive forces, fluids and, and solids really behave the same way. They can resist 
that compressive force with a static deformation. But a shear force, they are different. Solid can resist a shear force with a static deformation. A fluid must undergo continuous deformation to resist a shear force. And that's the real difference between fluids and solids. So just some notes about that. We'll say here that a solid can resist a shear stress by a static deformation, while a fluid cannot. And again, most important word in here is a shear stress. So a fluid will continuously deform under shear. Now if we were to start to write this out mathematically, at this stage what we've said is that a shear force for a solid, a shear force is a function of theta. Exactly what that function looks like is a characteristic of the material. And you'll be taking lots about that in mechanics of materials classes. Whereas with a fluid, that shear force is a function of the rate of change of theta. So mathematically, this is the difference between a fluid and a solid. This is a function of theta. This is a function of the rate at which theta is changing. Now exactly what this function looks like is going to be a topic of this class a little bit, but also uh, future classes that you're going to take. Right now, this is the key difference. Theta here, d theta dt here. Now, as I said before, whether this is a liquid or a gas is really of very minor importance in this class. Certainly in our thermodynamics class, the difference between liquids and gases, we spent a lot of time worrying about that and making sure we, we knew what phase we were in. But in this course, the types of problems we're going to look at, liquids and gases, they're both fluids, and their properties, of course, are different. But there is no fundamental difference between those two with regard to this particular definition. Next thing we want to do is take a look at what this function might look like. So we're going to plot here shear stress versus shear strain rate. So notice we're going here from talking about a force applied to that top plate to a shear stress. Well, that's just the force divided by the area of the plate. So a stress is a force divided by area. So you can think of this vertical axis as that force, just on a per unit area basis. And this shear strain rate is d theta by dt. So theta would be the strain, the strain rate would be d theta by dt. So if we take a look at different fluids on this plot, the most common ones, and the ones we're going to be working with exclusively in this course, are called Newtonian fluids. And a Newtonian fluid has a linear relationship between shear stress and shear strain rate. That's the definition of a Newtonian fluid. So this is a straight line. And like I say, that's the type of fluids we're going to be using in this class. So water, air, lubricating oils, those are all Newtonian fluids. And so certainly a very, very wide range of, of uh, fluids that would be of concern in mechanical engineering are Newtonian. So we'll be working exclusively with those types of fluids. Now, before we just leave it at that, though, we should look at some other possibilities so that you're aware of them. There are some fluids that are called shear thickening fluids. So a shear thickening or a dilettante fluid, as you strain it faster, the rate at which the shear stress increases also increases. So notice this is a straight line. This one is not. The fluid is appearing to thicken as you shear it faster and faster. And that's typically achieved by having a very high concentration of very, very small solid particles in your fluid. So high powder concentration slurries have this characteristic. The opposite can also happen. There is a class of fluids called shear thinning fluids or pseudoplastics. And examples of those are grease or paint or mayonnaise. A lot of food products actually are, are shear thinning fluids. So the characteristics of those on the shear stress versus shear strain rate plot are that the faster you shear them, the thinner they appear. In other words, the slope of this line decreases. So if we think of all of these in terms of a slope, Newtonian fluid has a constant slope. Shear thickening fluids have a increasing slope as we shear faster. 
and shear thinning fluids have a decreasing slope as we shear faster. Notice that all of these things always have positive slopes, meaning that the faster you shear them, the larger the shear stress is going to be. They're all positive, that always increases. The difference is how quickly it increases. Whether the slope of this is constant, as it is in Newtonian, whether it's increasing, as it is in shear thickening, or whether it's decreasing, as it is in shear thinning fluids. Now these shear thinning and shear thickening fluids add a lot of complexity to the analysis, so we're not going to be getting into that, as I mentioned. So the next thing we want to look at here is just some classifications of different areas of study in fluid mechanics, just to put the things that we're going to do in this course in context with the broader area of fluid mechanics. Well, the very first thing we can do is divide fluid mechanics into two parts, and that is fluid statics and fluid dynamics. And we're going to be spending a fair bit of time doing fluid statics in this course. That'll be the first major section of the course here after we're done the introduction is fluid statics. So we're going to be spending lots of time looking at fluid statics. Now that's not quite as simple as just a fluid at rest as we might uh, assume when we see that name. There's a little bit more to it than that, but certainly in general, we're going to be looking in fluids at rest when we look at fluid statics. So once our fluids start to move, of course, now we're looking at fluid dynamics. And we're also going to be looking at fluid dynamics quite a bit. So to further subdivide fluid dynamics, we'll split it into two parts, viscous fluid dynamics and inviscid fluid dynamics. Now what is this referring to? Well, on the previous slide, we looked at the relationship between shear stress and shear strain rate. And for a Newtonian fluid, we found that this was a straight line. Well, the slope of that line, we'll see a little bit later in the introduction, is called the viscosity of the fluid. So if the viscosity is important in a problem, then we have viscous fluid flow. And this is by far the more common case, and that's where we're going to be spending our time in this class. But there are some very important flows where we can actually ignore the effects of viscosity, and those are called inviscid flows. It turns out that analyzing fluids and ignoring the effects of viscosity is a very powerful and effective technique, particularly in aerodynamics. If you take the aerodynamics elective in fourth year, you will look at inviscid flow there because it's a very powerful tool in aerodynamics. But in this course, we're not going to spend any time on inviscid flow. So over on viscous flows, we can further divide those up into two different kinds, and we've sort of already introduced these. Those that have a non-Newtonian relationship between shear stress and shear strain rate, and Newtonian fluids. So again, we're not going to be looking at any non-Newtonian fluids. We're not going to be looking at any inviscid flow. We're going to be exclusively in fluid dynamics looking at Newtonian fluids. Now another subdivision here is the difference between laminar and turbulent flow. So laminar flow is flow where the particles of fluid are traveling in a very orderly fashion. If we think about a pipe flow, a laminar pipe flow, all of the particles of fluid are traveling parallel to the walls or parallel to the center line of the pipe, all in the same direction at the same time. A turbulent flow, however, while there certainly is still bulk motion of the fluid down the pipe, any individual particle of fluid is actually traveling in a very chaotic fashion, and that's called turbulent flow. So we'll be talking quite a bit about the distinction between these two things when we get to the pipe flow section of the course, and we're going to be considering both of those. Now it turns out that in most engineering equipment, turbulent flows are far more common than laminar flows. However, there are some very, very important flows that are laminar as well. So we'll be looking at both of those situations. The next classification that we want to look at is compressible and incompressible flows. And this actually could apply to both an inviscid analysis and a viscous analysis. 
Well, in this course, we're going to be exclusively looking at incompressible flows. So we won't be looking at compressible flow at all. Now notice that doesn't mean that we won't be looking at compressible substances. So we are certainly going to be looking at situations where the fluid that we're working with is air or perhaps nitrogen or oxygen or some other gas. But we can still treat this as an incompressible flow if the pressure variations are not very large. So all of the flow analysis we're going to be doing is going to be assuming a constant density of the fluid as it flows through whatever equipment we're looking at. Compressible fluid mechanics is a very important field and you will be taking compressible flow later on in your program. This is particularly important for high speed flight where the variations in pressure as the air flows over top of the aircraft are significant and we need to take that changing density into account in our analysis. But in our problems, the density is not going to change as the fluid moves from place to place in our flows. So we won't be looking at compressible flow in this course. The last classification here is internal and external flows. So this just refers to where the solid boundary is. So an example of an internal flow is a pipe flow. The fluid that we're analyzing, water perhaps, is inside of the pipe. So the boundaries are completely enclosing the fluid that we're studying. An example of an external flow would be an airplane wing. Again, we have a solid object that we're interested in, but we're interested in the flow outside of that solid object. So the flow over top of an airplane wing is an external flow, and the flow inside of a pipe, you know, or a pump or a heat exchanger or something like that is called an internal flow. So we're going to be looking certainly at both of those, primarily internal flows, but we're going to look also at quite a few external flows. So you'll see examples in both of these categories as we move forward here. So this is just an overall classification of the field of fluid mechanics. So that's a very, very brief introduction to the topic. In the next lecture, we're going to be clearing off a few miscellaneous things like units and looking at some of the properties that are important in fluid mechanics. So we'll see you in the next lecture. Bye for now.